Но разве не известно, кто мог убить Мартина Лютера Кинга? Они давно это готовили и не скрывали, что готовят. They saw it as fulfilling all their major stereotypes of U.S. society and of the violence of American racism. King's assassination fulfilled all that. America's undeniable race problem was a powerful tool in Soviet anti-American propaganda. Every act of racial violence provided more fuel to the fire. The fact that we have institutionalized and informal forms of racial segregation is a, a real sore point that communist propagandists, you know, are having a field day with. But Soviet anti-racism wasn't simply propaganda. It was also a kind of national pride to show solidarity with people of color. To become a new Soviet man or a new Soviet woman really meant to become an anti-racist. First and foremost, anti-racism was one of the central tenets of Marxism-Leninism, that also this anti-racism is very practical, especially with the rise of the Cold War. It sort of feeds the needs of Soviet foreign policy. Teddy Goes to the USSR is a podcast series that explores the Soviet Union through an American tourist's eyes. Episode 4, Teddy Talks About Race, is available now, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples, the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This episode, I have a new state councillor, Curtis, and a new boyer, Luke, to thank for signing up to support the podcast on Patreon. Apple Podcast listeners can now subscribe to the show within the app to listen to exclusive member episodes. Just click on the subscribe button on the podcast page. In today's special episode, I'm joined by Alexander Etkind to discuss the Russian Federation. Could it, will it, should it break up? So, on with the show. Hello, Alexander. Welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. And would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners? Hi, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm essentially a historian, a cultural historian, though I, I make all kinds of diversions in other sub-fields of history, such as environmental history and political history as well. Um, I, uh, told, I was edu- educated in uh, first in Russia, and then I defended my PhD decades ago in uh, Finland, in Helsinki. University. And then I taught at Cambridge, um, at the European University Institute at Florence. And uh, now I'm moving to the Central European University at Vienna. So that's uh, and, uh, that's my history. Everything else is said in my books, and I have written probably about a dozen. Yes, and um, you wrote one book called Internal Colonization, which came out well, about 10, 12 years ago, I think. That's true. Yeah, it was I think, one of the first books in English that was looking at the, you know, kind of a buzzword that people are talking about now of the Russian, Russia being a colonial empire still. And so today we were going to talk about something that you've written a few articles about, which recently as well, and other people have been talking about, of could Russia break up? Could it, will it, should it break up? And um, so if we could start off by saying, uh, could it break up? And 
what do we, people, we mean when we say that Russia today is still a colonial empire? Yeah, I know. In my book, um, I sort of made this argument that, uh, um, look, everyone knows that Russia uh, was an empire, was an empire, the Russian empire, you know, everyone knows this, uh, this words, uh, but somehow people uh, used to think that uh, while uh, many other empires also had colonies and having colonies is what constitutes an empire. Russia, the Russian Empire was somehow exempt of this, uh, as if there was a uh, colony, uh, as if there was an empire without colonies. Of course, it just, uh, you know, it just can, can be so. It, uh, the, the, the words do, this words do not work, work like that. So where was this colonies of the Russian Empire? <clears throat> but uh, I'm, I'm talking about history. Uh, but uh, largely the same the same uh, thing continued through the Soviet period. The Soviet Union was also a sort of agglomeration of different republics, as they called it, and also for the current Russia. So um, there were um, uh, external colonies, you know, um, ones that the Russian Empire uh, occupied and. Un annexated and uh, then colonized, uh, like Central Asia or the Caucasus or Alaska at some point. Um, and uh, then, um, or the Crimea. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, when an empire takes uh, a land and holds it for years and decades and centuries, uh, so this colony becomes a kind of internal part of the empire. It's still different in so, some respects, maybe linguistical, maybe religious, maybe economic, uh, but it's still an uh, internal colony. You know, this is uh, places like Tatarstan in the contemporary Russia, or Bashkortostan, or Buryatia, um, huge expanses of Siberia, the Ural Mountains, uh, you know, this uh, story of the Crimea, of course, is a great example of how colonies change hands. Um, so um, this uh, transformation from the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union, which happened during the revolution, because of the revolution of 1917, and then from the Soviet Union to the Russian Federation that happened in 1991. So that, this, they were this huge, huge acts of decolonization. So well, we understand decolonization, say the British Empire, retreated, say, from India, or the 18th century retreated from, from uh, the Americas. So, you know, the United States of America is a post-colonial country because it used to be a colony, then it became, it, it, then it was post-colonial. And for a while, uh, the Americans uh, felt the feelings and struggled the fights of this of a post-colonial country, like India nowadays. And uh, with Russia, you know, it, it happened, so it retreated from the Baltic countries, as it retreated from Alaska in the 19th century. It retreated from Ukraine, retreated from Central Asia, retreated from Caucasus. But it did not retreat from Siberia, did not retreat from the, the Russian North or from the Russian South. And all this, and remember, still, Russia is still the biggest country in the world. So it's still a very, very big and very heterogeneous country, meaning that it consists of many different parts. And, um, you know, from history we know that every empire uh, uh, has failed at some point. Uh, and we also know that it is a very low, slow, multi-step, multi-dimensional, painful process. So uh, I, I'm just thinking that the fate the, of the Russian Empire, the fate of the Soviet Union, uh, will be at some point shared by the Russian Federation. 
uh, when it will happen, I, I will not tell you, you know, how it will happen, we, we, can, we can discuss it. Will it happen? Uh, absolutely. Um, and of course, every sort of intentional um, crisis or, or that, uh, that the Russian rulers uh, imposed on themselves or on their neighbors, like the current war in Ukraine. Obviously, such a, such a major crisis uh, makes this, you know, increases the chances of an actual collapse, of an actual dismemberment of the Federation. Yeah, so if we talk about the, the we have the historical part of Russia, as we might say, is you know, around Moscow, the central part of Russia now. In the north, we have you know, I think small indigenous tribes mainly these days. Uh, Siberia have a whole bunch of different peoples. On the Urals, we've got, yes, you know, Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, Chuvashia, Murcia. Do you think that there's much of a, you know, an idea within Russia itself among different peoples that they are colonized or is it kind of just a, a minority viewpoint? Yeah, it is definitely a minority of your point, but so many, many people, most of them probably are our colleagues, historians or whatever, sociologists and uh, uh, writers, intellectuals, they uh, start talking in these terms. But uh, I think it would be wrong. Yes, you, you, you mentioned se se several uh, uh, internal uh, territories that are populated by non-Russian ethnicities, so like the Chuvars, so Hanty Mansi, and uh, you know, many other Buryats, uh, many other um, people, Saha people, um, many other ethnicities whose name probably is not actually known to, uh, to our audience. And some of these people have, you know, um, dozens or hundreds of thousands um, and some of these lands uh, were rich by natural resources and also highly educated people. If we're talking about, say, Tatarstan or Bashkortostan. Um, but another thing is that it would be wrong to imagine all these processes and all these uh, lands uh, in, et on, in uh, ethnic terms. This is really not only about ethnicity. Sometimes it is about ethnicity. But it's definitely not only about that. For instance, uh, in my home city, St. Petersburg, where I was born, the, there have been a, a long-standing uh, kind of intellectual movement of, uh, of also journalists, uh, intellectuals who were, you know, urging for uh, emancipating St. Petersburg from the Russian Federation. Uh, well, they said that um, first, first they were discontent for, for very long for, you know, the last decade at least. They've been discontent by the Moscow politics. And they believe that there was like serious contradictions, or, uh, serious differences between the, whatever, the political ethos of Moscow and uh, the culture of St. Petersburg. Then they said that, that uh, Petersburg would be doing very well, would be just doing much better, would develop the, its universities and museums and uh, architectural uh, landmarks much better if it were independent, uh, if it could be, you know, just trading and uh, exchanging students and tourists, etc., with Norway or with uh, Great Britain, etc., uh, you know, without interference of Moscow. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's I, I think that's all true. It doesn't mean that... Um, there is a kind of specific ethnicity in Petersburg. It's still, you know, the same Russians, the same Ukrainians, the same Tatars who live there, the same Jews. Uh, Petersburg is as multi-ethnic as Moscow. Um, but uh, indeed, there are important differences, and Petersburg would have been doing better. Uh, and that's, I think, is probable. Now, wh why uh, this doesn't happen? Why this has not happened? why this will not happen like tomorrow or in a month from now. Because Moscow has its money, its power, or its troops. 
to uh, suppress this sort of uh, separatism in St. Petersburg. But in fact, uh, Moscow is doing so stupid and so kind of detrimental things right now that it is losing its money, its troops, its uh, authority. So, you know, every day we were reading about that in, in the newspapers. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the further it goes, the less um, power Moscow has over, say, St. Petersburg or over Siberia or over uh, the Caucasus. So that, that's the, that, the dynamic that we're watching right now. When you see foreign commentary that's been appearing the last couple of weeks, uh, it's like they imagine that there are these ethnic areas of Russia that can just be split off like you know, India. They're not Russian, the other people. Whereas actually, of course, apart from a couple of you know, small states in the Caucasus and uh, Tatarstan, I think, every region of Russia has an ethnic Russian major majority. So if Russia was going to break up, there would have to be Russians breaking away as well. I think back in the beginning of the 90s after the Soviet Union broke up, there was a, a bit of a centrifugal forces at work. Then we had the Yekaterinburg tried to issue its own currency for a while, and uh, the Far East of Vladivostok was basically doing whatever it wanted for a few years under Yeltsin. Not quite, not quite as simple as just ethnic areas breaking away. Yeah, exactly. It's not that simple. And I think it's even with India, it was not, or definitely with the uh, with the American colonies, it was not that simple. You know, the majority were British. You know, they were English speaking these colonists, etc. But they had, you know, their own interests, economic interests. They, they were developing their own culture. They believed that the, the American culture was different from English culture, even though they spoke English. And the same, you know, the same happens in um, places like, uh, like, like, like Kazan or, or Saint Petersburg, etc. Or Novosibirsk, uh, uh, an academic center of Siberia, which which was proud of its science and uh, university, uh, the high you know high learning, and uh, they feel that they are really suppressed and discriminated by Moscow. Um, yeah, Russian majority, uh, yes, even in Tatarstan, the majority, uh, of course, uh, are Russian speakers, but in Ukraine, as you know, say in Kiev, the majority by far were Russian, spe Russian, Russian, spe Russian speakers, and uh, you, moreover, people with Russian identity. In Riga, the capital of Latvia, the majority is Russian speakers. So this uh, uh, ethnic, uh, definitely the linguistic definition is not decisive for political purposes, and we're talking about politics. It seems that there's a lot of young non-ethnic Russian activists uh, uh, getting very interested in reviving their languages around Russia at the moment. Yeah, there are interesting events. They say there was, there was this uh, horrible um, uh, incident in Udmurtia. Yeah. Uh, uh, Murcia, if 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 you listen to know this country, yes, I've, I've mentioned it when we introduced the Finno-Ugrian peoples. So. Yeah, it's the eastern part of European Russia, somewhere near the Urals, with the capital of Izhevsk. And uh, a young professor of um, the local university burned himself uh, in protest for discriminating against the Udmurtian language. So there are, you know, there are other cases. Uh, this Udmurtian language is, a different, is truly different uh, from, say, Russian, but, say, there are areas populated by the Pomore, uh, that's the northern coast of, uh, that's the coast of, um, of the White Sea. Uh, there were northern pro provinces of European Russia. And this Pomore, they were, you know, they were descendants of probably ethnic Russians, but they had a different lifestyle. They, they never had served them. For instance, they were fishermen. 
and they specialize on hemp rather than on grain, things like that. And they develop their own culture and uh, sort of own that, you know, some, some scholars believe it is uh, their own language, some scholars believe it is a dialect. Um, but there are, you know, people who study it, people, there are people who write dictionaries of this language. There are, uh, there are you know, ethnographers and sociologists who, who, who study it. And, and they were, they, they've been truly discriminated. They, they, they got their grants from Norway, mostly. Uh, so the Norway supported, as, as a neighboring country, ac ac across the sea, they supported um, this kind of scholarship. And then uh, Russia, uh, then Moscow, decided that it was against uh, Russian national interest and some of these people were sort of sacked from the university. Some, you know, they had major problems. So I, I, I believe that it is Moscow that politicized this issue. So scholars study whatever the Pomor language and uh, write dictionaries, uh, they, they, they would be doing fine and uh, would be very peaceful people, these scholars, but you know, while they are sacked, while they are sort of while, while they are threatened by arrest, of course they they turn to politics, so kind of political resistance against the Moscovite power. It seems like the central government is currently trying to suppress national languages a bit in Russia. I mean, that they've uh, moved against moved against them being taught in schools and things. <laughs> But in fact, I believe uh, that uh, the economic factors are mo more, more important. See, uh, right now we learn that, you, you know, that there is this, uh, the so-called exclave of Kaliningrad, and, uh, uh, which, which historically uh, is Eastern Prussia. Historically, it was a part of Prussia, you know, and kind of very sort of important and noble part of Prussia. The uh, Prussian kings were... Uh, crowned in Königsberg, which which is now called Kaliningrad, so it was like the, actually the, the center of historical center of Prussia, and Prussia, of course, uh, was the center of the German Empire, which now German. so uh, cultural, historically, whatever this um, uh, Kaliningradska gubernia uh, really belongs to the German uh, cultural domain. But linguistically, ethnically, etc., so all these, you know, almost all of these Germans were either killed or evacuated uh, during the World War II. So then the Russians came and populated this land. So it's like 100% Russian speaking population. But they do have their own economic interests. They trade with Poland, they trade with uh, Germany, they trade with um, Lithuania. Uh, and, um, and they have no com common border. With, um, with the rest of Russia. So all, tra all trade, all supplies, whatever, they, they go through Lithuania, uh, railways, uh, highways. So Lithuania yesterday announced that it, it would stop because of the war and sanctions, Lithuania would stop this transit trade. So it will not allow any more supplies to go uh, to Lithuanian territory. And obviously, as a sovereign state, Lithuania has all the rights to do that. Of course, Russia could, you know, could say, could, could, could respond uh, militarily, you know, because it's, it's actually uh, it, Russia's strategic interest to supply Kaliningrad with, with uh, food or oil or ammunition. Because there is a, there are major major you know uh, troops and uh, and missiles and all this stuff uh, concentrated in Kaliningrad and and um, directed towards Europe. So uh, that, that's basically that's that's potentially that's a casus belli uh, uh, reason for war. But of course, Lithuania is a member of the NATO, and, uh, and uh, that's this, uh, this historical developments, they are actually are crucial. And they could, you know, develop in different directions. It could, uh, could uh, lead to a sort of expansion of the Ukrainian war onto Baltic lands, which people really, people were kind of predicting and people were afraid of that for very long. It could also 
lead in the opposite direction, like if Russia has no troops, no power, no stamina <laughs> to occupy Lithuania. So that, that would mean that Kaliningrad would be fully dependent on the supplies from Poland or from Germany, whatever, from Sweden, across the sea, and it will basically be less and less and less dependent uh, on Russia every day. It would kind of, you know, there's this uh, economic ties and human ties. Um, with Russia would be, you know, less and less significant. Say human ties, uh, they, they were pretty, pretty unsig insignificant for, for year, years. So soldiers learned that there were, you know, many times more uh, students from Kaliningrad, from Kaliningrad who, visited, who, who visited Germany or Poland than those who visited Moscow or St. Petersburg. So actually, the tourism, for, for very clear reasons, tourism, you know, entertainment, and uh, much of commerce, uh, even, even bef before these hostilities, it was oriented towards the West. But now, of course, it will be developing more and more so. Obviously, that's you know, one way that I think that applies to the Far East as well, but it's just a very long way away from European Russia and uh, can gradually drift away a bit. I know here in New Zealand, we have a lot of Russian immigrants from the Far East, and there's something about them that's just different to European Russians to me. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, it's interesting to look at uh, the, the, there are some studies of say, tur tourism, you know, that Russians uh, do or did before the war and before the current self-isolation of Russia. And uh, of course, the Siberian was much easier for Siberia for people from say, Novosibirsk, Novosibirsk uh, Khabarovsk to go to Thailand, you know, for locations than go to Sochi. You know, it's just so, so much cheaper also, and uh, you know, less hours, you know, less thousands of do of, uh, of dollars to spend. And um, yeah, and and th 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 this of course uh, led to the isolation of different regions. You know, of the Russian Federation from one another in human terms, in cultural terms, tourist terms, communication terms. Internet actually helped. Or internet was a major sort of counter force to this sort of century fugal tendencies. Yeah, but <laughs> the current Russian authorities, they have, you know, they, they have their bad feelings about internet as well. So we don't, we don't, we don't even know what internet keep. Or would the internet keep working in Russia for you know for, for long from now? Yeah, but do you think that these you know central efforts to like reduce use of ethnic languages or suppress the internet or various other you know moves against free speech or you know freedom of assembly or associations will be counterproductive? That they will actually strengthen it. And I've seen, I've I've listened to several interviews with quite young people, you know, twenty year old activists from various areas. You know, I'm talking about ethnic activists, you know, mainly looking for speaking their languages more. And they, for them, like 2014 is the starting point. It was the annexation of Crimea is what inspired them to go out and become activists. So. It seems like that Putin's imperial activities are creating a reaction back against it as well. For some people, that's definitely true. For some people, uh, you know, uh, there were other triggers. There is an important uh, ecological movement in Russia, and uh, particularly in some regions, not so much in Moscow, unfortunately. But you know, certain regions of Russia there were, where there were you know really poisonous factories or some mining activities. You know, people were protesting and protesting, and uh, and it was very political. And uh, it, it was say, in Voronezhka, Bernie governance, or it was because of this kind of uh, chemical mining activities. And uh, or of course, the best known case is this uh, ecological protest in uh, the Ar Arkhangel Gubernia in Shias, where the where Moscow created a huge garbage uh, bin, so how, how, how to call it, was, it was like many acres of 
just while garbage that uh, lorries brought from Moscow and just dumped there. Uh, with no, with no, whatever, with, with no cultivation or the, no, no, no decorating this garbage was, uh, was so the, you know, the whole area was uh, poisoned and polluted. And, and the local people were, and many of them were actually those Pamors, whom, whom I was talking about, but most of them were Russians. They actually start, started, to, uh, you know, they, 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 they turned to violence. They uh, barricaded the roads. They didn't allow the slurries to come. And, uh, you know, thousands of people were involved. Uh, it was like a stand standoff that lasted for uh, months and was highly covered. So, so I think this, uh, and say for these people in Northern Russia, their garbage, uh, you know, their pollution, local pollution there was way more important than the occupation of Crimea, which was, you know, many thousands of miles away. Yeah, so more regional issues, yeah. Which is also perhaps a reaction against increasing centralization because you know, they, they seem to be making everything more and more centralized all the time, don't they? Which is taking away the ability of local governments to do anything in response to what people want in their regions. No, but most, uh, most issues in, 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 in such a big country, most issues are regional. That's the point. You know, Mo 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 Moscow, Moscow thinks that, you know, uh, the, the Moscow issues are the most important for everyone. But of course, people in Shias, they believe that their garbage bin is more important and they, and they are perfectly right. And, uh, you know, Moscow has created such a huge inequality in its whole country. You know, it's like Moscow lives like, you know, like Qatar or something like it's a few, few more, 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 It's like um, the, um, Median income in Moscow is like many, many, many times higher than median incomes in Siberia. So, of course, Siberians don't like it. And while Moscow, Moscow is, they, they do, do not know it, they like it, but they do not know it. They don't know how, how people live in Siberia. So, if we, we agree that Russia could break up, if we're thinking about will it break up, you see it's most likely to be kind of regions that are further away, just drifting away would be the process, rather than being an ethnic breakaway. I think that it will be more like uh, local uh, uh, strikes, local demonstrations, local protests. And uh, that that they will that this local protest could have more impact than say, those protests in Moscow of 2012, that we remember, because they they were suppressed um, by basically by the police. But say this sub protests in Shias was it was really difficult to suppress them, and of course now nowadays that when you know all the troops, all the national guard. They are all day in Ukraine, so yes, things will start, you know, happening in Kaliningrad or in Arkhangelsk or whatever, or in Siberia. That would mean, you know, that the, this empire would have to, you know, withdraw some part of its troops from Ukraine, which would be actually good for Ukraine. Um, so I, I, I expect think the, things like that would happen because of sanctions, because of. Um, incompetence of authorities, you know, this local uh, issues, economic and ecological and other issues will sort of develop and exacerbate more and more, you know, sharper and sharper. And, uh, and uh, you know, the attention span of the Moscow authorities is very narrow. They, they can't really do two, two things at once. They can do only one. So we'll see how it will go. What about regional strongmen trying to grab their own, make their own power grab? Yeah, this at some point that's all, that will be also be a factor. But of course, these strongmen they are doing pretty well. You know, they have their yacht, they had their yachts in the Mediterranean or in the Caribbean. You know, now nowadays many of these yachts uh, or villas have been um, seized or arrested. And, uh, I'm kind of looking at these statistics; it's outrageous. But um, of course, uh, these uh, strongmen, they used to be 
feeling well, but not anymore. So someone like if you imagine yourself, you know, a strong man in you know, Siberia, mid-sized city, you are doing some kind of corrupt business there, you have a yacht in, uh, in Tuscany, and uh, because of this sort of entirely irre irrelevant war, irrelevant, irrelevant to you because you are in Siberia, so your yacht, your villa, your like everything that you you've been working for, all your vacations, all your vacation plans, it's all canceled. So you are locked in that Siberian town with your corrupted money that you cannot use really. You know, what what, what you, you over there you already have everything. You don't really want want to be there at all. You want to be you know in Tuscany. So these people are increasingly unhappy, uh, and so of course some of them are you know hugely patriotic and nationalist and etc but i think many of them are just unhappy and they are just waiting for for the you know for the end of all this but this end is not coming we don't see it coming and they don't see it coming they, they are probably better informed than we are so that's they are they are all in in their own crisis and they will respond to this crisis in you know, many different ways. Well, and uh, Putin could die, of course, and then would be a whole new thing. Absolutely. They're also waiting for that. We're all waiting for that, aren't we? Well, which leads on as well to talk maybe about uh, the prospects for democracy, democracy then. And a break, if Russia breaks up, would it be better or worse for Russian democracy? Uh, both probably, and it will it will be vastly different in different parts, and different you know new new newly independent states. They will be all different, and uh, and they should be all different. You know, Chechnya is one thing, and whatever Buryatia is entirely another thing, uh, or Saint Petersburg. So um, some some of these parts will try to you know to develop in the sort of Western. Uh, uh, democratic ways, uh, there, there is a good chance for St. Petersburg to be something like New Zealand. So. Um, in, the, in, some, in some future, Petersburg, might, maybe together with Karelia, or, or maybe Karelia, Karelia would, be, would prefer to be uh, independent from Petersburg, or, you know, it, but it will be a long historical process that will decide that. But of course, the, you know, some other parts will be violent and uh, the border, border issues will be you know, terribly difficult to define because you know, that will be all kind of up, updated again, and uh, there will be no authority to say, you know, where, where, where is the actual border between Chechnya and, and Indushetia. So only, you know, only violence will decide you know, where, where this border will be. Um, and of course, uh, that will be complex uh, and. Um, and generally unpleasant picture to see all these developments and hostilities and uh, uh, sparks in the lands that the Western politicians have never heard about. Um, and of course, Western politicians really don't want to do that, don't want to deal with all that. They, they really would be happy if Moscow kind of settled it all you know, once and forever. But the mother is historical situations when these lazy politicians they have to sit down and maybe even invite some experts and uh, and uh, find out you know they did they did find out at some point what was Uzbekistan that was a kind of a revelation for them and there will be a revelation for them to find out about Udmurtia. I expect Russia will eventually break up, but um, I think it will also be a very violent process when it actually happens. I don't see it going down very peacefully at all. Yeah, but but you know, could it be worse than now? Than, than now, there is a major war, major 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 violence going on, you know, with no good reason. An actual threat of the nuclear war, uh, an actual threat of uh, a new world war. I I, I think uh, in many in many respects it could not possibly be worse than what's going on now. You're talking from New Zealand, I'm talking from Switzerland now. I mean, let's talk about humanity, you know, but uh, just the number of victims and all that. Um, I mean, it, it could be worse than now, like a nuclear war, of course, would be worse, 
or uh, you know world war would be worse than Ukrainian war, but Ukrainian war is actually is effectively leading to to all those. So I, I think that's really you know any development any development would be positive from this from this point. Any political reform, any kind of revision, any sort of any, any revolution, any major thing that would happen in Eurasia would be better than the current situation. Yeah, because we're talking about uh, you know various parts of Russia leaving. If we say you know, St. Petersburg would go off by itself or something else, if that were to happen, then we would still have the same problems that we have causing this in Ukraine. But some group in Russia is going to say those are Russian lands and we should get them back. Yeah, but, you know, Russia, obviously, Russia is a big and powerful country. Or, say, Moscow, Moscow is a big and powerful uh, region. But, obviously, it's, these powers are not uh, limitless. There are limits to them. So, uh, you know, if, if, if Moscow will not be able to respond, you know, both to, to the violence in the Caucasus and to the strikes in whatever, in, on, on the... Siberian railway and to the peaceful demonstrations in Petersburg, Moscow will have to do, you know, to, to choose something. And, and we see what Moscow has chosen. I actually think that Moscow has no, 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 no resources whatsoever. You know, everything is there in Ukraine. You know, all these troops, all these troops that were like, you know, like stationed in Siberia for two or three centuries, they were kind of guarding this enormous Chinese border. Uh, and they, they were probably there for good reasons, you know. Uh, they, they have been withdrawn, you know, they are all in Ukraine. So if, if, if say, China or, or Mongolia or, or Kazakhstan will start doing something interesting, you know, something new, you know, there are no troops there. So, so, so what you say, of course, is you know, generally true, but, uh, it, you know, Moscow will, will, will definitely choose uh, choose one sing, single problem with which where to which it will sort of direct its efforts and it could be it could be petersburg it could be uh, the euros and uh, we don't know but uh, definitely moscow will not manage the whole space anymore do you think there would be a point where you know not maybe necessarily putin but a still a putinist style government would just give up and let people go their own way, like maybe a bit, you know, like 1991, collapse of the Soviet Union, just decide that they don't have, you know, it seems, you know, people will say, you know, Putin is Hitler or Putin is Stalin, whatever, but Putin is not actually, you know, killing millions of his own citizens or imprisoning millions in a gulag or anything like that. And well, it could go far, just to mention whatever the American uh, war. For independence, you know, but at, you know it was long and bloody. But at some point, yes, indeed, King George you know, said, "Okay, the way I, I give up. Uh, let them let them do whatever." You know, there is you know I'm, for, for some reason I'm thinking not about textbooks of history, but about Hamilton uh, <laughs> opera. <laughs> but uh, you know, yes, and Putin, or you know, Putin uh, maybe it will be Putin's grandson at, at that point. But yes, indeed, uh, you know they will give up. And they will say, okay, we have our uh, estates near Moscow. And, you know, if we continue you know, to fight in the Urals, um, uh, our estates in uh, Zhukovka. At some point, it just has to be too much work to do it, isn't it? Exactly, too much work to do and uh, too much money. And they don't have this money any, anymore. I mean, that's an entirely new situation that Russia doesn't have money. I think it would be interesting if we saw like mainly Russian ethnic areas trying to break away, I think it would be a completely different situation to say, you know, Chechnya or somewhere trying to go. I think if Tuva decided to leave, I don't think most ordinary Russians would be bothered. Well, I don't know. I mean, there are some rich people uh, who have their, their duchess over there in Altai or maybe in Tuva, or maybe in Kakasia. Putin has his... Uh, Stay, one of his estates there, somewhere there. So some Russians would bother, but of course, Tuva is also a sort of a, it's lo, lo, landlocked over there, and uh, probably the world will not care very much about Tuva, but the world would care about 
many other areas. As, as the world did care about the Crimea, of course. Well, I think uh, the um, Hansimansisk Ugra would be an interesting area because it is an ethnic minority area, but very sparsely populated and produces most of Russia's oil. Yeah, exactly. It produces most of Russia's oil, but so hopefully the world will not you know, be uh, buying the Russian oil anymore. At least Europe will not. So this uh, oil from Kantamansiysk will have to find its new current south and east to China. To, to, uh, but there are, of course, no, no, no pipelines. And Russia cannot build these pipe pipelines. Russia can build railways anymore. So this oil in Hantamansisko, of course, my hope. Um, I, 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 you know, I was working on that. Uh, that's my my most recent book is about natural resources in Russia and in the world, both nature's evil, uh, cultural history of, of natural resources. So my hope that we were well in the era of Anthropocene. So my hope is that Russian oil will stay where it belongs you know, to, to the marshes of uh, of the Hunt and Mansi endemic peoples. That's where we just uh, move to the last part on should Russia break up? And let's just have a talk about it. What, what would be the benefits to the people of Russia and everybody else if the Russian Federation as a colonial empire broke up? A good question. I mean... And, and it's difficult even to think about you know, how to respond to it because it's so much about the future. But uh, uh, a way to paraphrase this question, and I think it's more manageable, is like uh, what are the benefits of the current, uh, what are the benefits of the of the Russian Federation for the peoples of Russia? What, what does it do? What does the Federation do for them? Um, I mean, uh, the. The last uh, two or three decades really were a disaster. You know, corruption in this huge, huge amounts. We know we, we used to know it about it you know, from the Western uh, spies, essentially. But now we, we know about it from Navalny's shows, and Navalny's shows you know, were very, very illuminating. You know, everyone knows about you know this huge, huge numbers and uh, disgusting interiors. And also exteriors of this uh, villas uh, and policies uh, of the Russian so-called elite. So that corruption is one thing that you know, and the corruption is really a, a big thing. It's like many, many, many billions of dollars that could go to whatever to pensions, to hospices, to kindergartens, to schools, to universities, to hospitals all over Russia. And instead of that, it went to this yachts. Say this. Uh, Putin's yacht under the PQ, under the under the nice name Sheherazad. How, how it's in English? Sheherazad. Sheherazad. Yeah. Mm. is the the heroine of the one thousand yeah, one nights. Thousand one nights. Yeah. Uh, the storytellers of Putin chose to name his yachts uh, after her. So it is estimated in seven hundred millions. Seven hundred million dollars. Uh, it's seized in Tuscany. Uh, it is uh, slightly. It, it is shorter than the cruiser Moscow that was sunk recently by the uh, by the Ukrainian missile. So the Shekherazad is shorter but heavier than the cruiser Moscow. It's heavier. So this cruiser, which had a crew of 50, 50 uh, uh, of 500 people who mostly died, and all these cannons, missiles, you know, helicopters or whatever over there, uh, versus this yacht with um, um, details. So this yacht weighs more, has more displacement, than the cruising. So this yacht was built in a, by, by a German uh, werf, uh, near Bremen, a kind of military, uh, uh, comp uh, military uh, company that also builds um, 
corvettes and frigates for the German Navy. So this yacht costs as much as three German corvettes that have also, also been put in. So, so the, the, this particular uh, wharf has, has announced um, downsizing. Slightly before, slightly before the war. So they built a yacht for Sechin, a yacht for Putin, several other, you know, many other yachts. For, for whom we don't know. But then, you know, coming to the sanctions, to the, to the war, so they downsize. So now they specialize on, on their corvettes, corvettes and frigates for the Germany. So it's, it's, it's absolutely outrageous. Now, what to do with this yacht? So now, now it's basically arrested. Okay? So, um, Say, say villas in also arrested in uh, Italy. Say villas of the Russian prop prop propaganda Ankar uh, Solovyov. So, yeah, Vladimir Solovyov. So he had four villas, not one villa, but four palatial villas on on Lake Como. You know, the possibly the most expensive you know, part of Italy and, and of Europe. So he had four villas there. Okay, but these villas are seized. Of course, it's a difficult legal question. How you know how, what to do with them? But but at least villas could be used for whatever, hospices or for. Uh, my, 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 I I I was trying to look at you know that they would be used for a local university and we would establish some kind of departments for Ukrainian and Russian students there. But but whatever Vill villas could be could be actually gainfully used, but. What to do with this yacht? There is no way that it could be used for any reasonable purpose. So it's you know, basically either it will be sold to uh, whatever to the remaining billionaires of this world in whatever near East and China, which is not a good thing, or it's, it will be destroyed essentially. So basically, this corruption is entirely um, unproductive. It's, it's really kind of destroys the not. not national wealth. So we we're talking, you know, we're returning to this issue, what, what the Russian Federation does for Russia, or for, for, for the people of Russia. So it kind of sucks, uh, sucks the money, this money comes from natural resources, I mean, this money comes 100% from this oil, from Hante Mansi. So then this oil basically going through this capitalist machine, um, in, in Europe, it, it, it turns into this pathetic yacht. Um, basically, it's frozen. It, it, does, it, it, it is excluded from any economy, from a Russian economy, from European economy, either. Now, what else What else Russian Federation does? So it uh, sort of builds this uh, enormous army, you know, all these conscripts, young, young men, who could, you know, instead of going to universities, they uh, basically they go to this uh, really you know, really bad army. You know, it's bad in terms of you know military efficiency. It's also very very bad in terms of its uh, internal morale. We know you know other stories about about uh, this army all, all the time. Um, and then they return from this army. You know, if they survive, of course, and they spread this. You know. Uh, violent customs and mores uh, over the you know over the Russian population, over, over Russian women, over Russian children. This you know this is how this um, um, counterproductive culture reproduces itself through the army, through prisons, through schools. So what else? You know, very bad educational standards really bad schools, really bad, and increasingly bad universities all, all over Russia. We can judge about it professionally. So what, what, you know, what else does it do? Some kind of uniformity, uniformity of what, of language, of education, uh, all over Russia, but is, is it a good thing? We kind of believe now that uh, diversity is a good thing. So, so we don't really believe in this imperial uniformity as an advantage, as, as, as an asset, we believe now in the opposite. Uh, can you add something? You know, what does Russian Federation do for the people of peoples of Russia, for every Russian citizen? It just takes from him. 
auch das ah. you know uh, mortality rate is one one of the worst in the world you know like life, life expectancy is one of, of the worst I'm, I'm now looking very seriously at at, at the uh, it's called um, a life expectancy expectancy gap between men and women in russia and it is uh, the biggest in the world it, and it's it's from 10 to 12 years so russian women live for 10 to 12 years more than russian men all over it's it's ever it's average and but it's actually less than the caucus it's 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 typical for it's interestingly typical for post-socialist slavic countries well this is the uh lifestyle things you're talking about propagating in the army and uh else isn't it really? yeah. yeah but it's uh, in the army but also i think it's also then sort of reproduces in the through the family because this uh so so women t live 10 or 12 state years longer basically that means that babushkas live with the with the nuclear family so grandfather grandfathers is a constant presence and fathers are away or dead mothers are overloaded so babushka grandmother take care of their children this is also how it reproduces this is yes it is a coherent lifestyle but is it a good one we believe that nuclear family is a sign of modernity all that so um yeah i do believe that uh, this huge space need major major change major revision and it should it should it should change but of course there are also huge forces of resistance that come from the beneficiaries of the system those people who you know who, who sees the money due to corruption who command their troops and all that and this resistance is yes it is very serious Yes, so it's going to be a very long process, I think. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Definitely so. But uh, wars, and historically we see it, that wars accelerate, accelerate change. It's a sad story, but, you know, if there were no war, there would be no revolution in Russia, there would be no collapse of Austria-Hungarian Empire, you know. Wars, that empires wage wars, and then these wars, Bury empires. Yeah, I think we can finish at that point. But before we go, you know, I've enjoyed many of your books, and uh, would you just like to tell listeners about some of your books that they can look for. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, right, right, I'm writing now. I'm, I'm, I'm right now in the process of writing a book, a new book called uh, Agony: Russia Against Modernity. And uh, it should be kind of a quick and sharp book, and I hope to finish it by 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 September for Policy Press. So when it will be done, we could talk about it again. Okay. And do you like to mention any of your other books? Yes. Uh, Nature's Evil thing came out last year. Yes, it came out last year. Warped Morning came the, uh, out so like probably five years ago or something. And um, yeah, and some and some others, uh, and some of the colonization that you mentioned, and the errors of the impossible that I I, I wrote like uh, already thirty years ago, but it's uh, still it's it's still been translated. Just last year, it, it was out in Italian language, so people are still interested in the strange subjects such as history of psychoanalysis in Russia. Okay, well. Thank you, Alexander, for coming on the show to talk to us. Um, Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you once again to Alexander for coming on the show today. I'm a big fan of Alexander's books, which I recommend to anyone interested in Russia, and particularly cultural history. You can find links to some of his books in the show notes and on the episode blog page. You heard a trailer at the beginning of the show for Teddy Goes to the USSR, a new six-episode podcast series by Sean Guillory of the University of Pittsburgh Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and Sean's Russia blog and podcast. 
It's well worth your time, and I recommend it to you all. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.